morning, everyone. Uh, so I'll be your moderator for today. Uh, I'm Sam Gebru. Uh, I'm the Managing Director of Black Lion Strategies, and I'm a non-resident senior fellow at the Tisch College um, uh, Center for State Policy Analysis at Tufts University. Um, and uh, through this role, I also serve as a consultant to the Massachusetts Public Banking Coalition, which is a sponsored project of the Alliance for Democracy. Um, today, we have a really exciting press conference uh, about uh, an act to establish a Massachusetts public bank. Uh, we have a really robust speaker list, so we're going to get to that uh, right away. And uh, we'll take some questions at the end. Uh, so for members of the uh, press, uh, feel free to uh, either raise your hand at the end uh, or uh, uh, to uh, drop a message in the chat box. So uh, whichever is better for you. Um, and then we'll go from there. But we'll get started uh, first and foremost with Representative Ayanna Presley. Um, I ask everyone to please keep your microphones on mute. Uh, thank you very much. Representative, floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Sam. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here today. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us just how important it is that we invest in our local communities. It has laid bare and exacerbated the stark economic inequities between individuals based on race, gender, and ethnicity. And it has worsened the inequities we've seen across our municipalities and impacted their ability to maintain public benefits and public institutions based on the income level of their residents. Right now, cities and states depend on money from giant banks, allowing those banks to leverage our public funds to enrich their investors through risky maneuvers and predatory lending, rather than reinvesting them in our communities. State and local governments have been on the front lines of the pandemic. When devastation hits, it's imperative that our state and local governments and small businesses have safe, reliable resources to stay afloat. Public banking would give our cities and states the option of controlling their public dollars and leveraging resources to remain in their own communities. Public banking would also be a game changer for our small minority and women-owned businesses, for our climate change entrepreneurs and other borrowers who currently depend on financing from big banks. These borrowers who could be major employers, change makers, and leaders too often are denied the financing they need to be successful and to thrive. This financial gap is a structural problem that has widened the opportunity gap and it's time we did something about it. As a member of the Financial Services uh, Committee in Congress, I am so grateful uh, for Senator Eldridge, Representative Zalgardo, and Connolly, and all of our advocates here today who have been fighting for a Massachusetts public bank. The legislation they're leading would establish the nation's second state-owned public bank and would help us to lay the groundwork for a just and equitable recovery from this pandemic by providing much needed flexible and low cost financing to municipalities and to our most vulnerable communities. And the truth is, this is not some pie in the sky proposal. Public banking works. In North Dakota, their 100 year old Bank of North Dakota is widely credited with helping the state's economy weather the 2008 recession far better than other states. So Massachusetts has an opportunity to be a pace letter, a pace setter to be a leader on this issue, as it has been on so many others. Because with public banking, we have a unique opportunity to not only provide financial stability for our communities, while also addressing the economic inequalities and structural racism prolonged by the predatory lending practices and credit decisions made by Wall Street. For decades, profit-motivated decisions have driven bank branches to disappear from low income communities, creating banking deserts, deserts that are dominated by predatory lenders. Locally controlled public banks would not need to weigh their servicing decisions on profitability alone. Instead, by partnering with local lenders, public banks would expand lending capacity to enter bank deserts while pushing back against traditional private financiers. As we rebuild and recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, we must fight for a financial system that provides a just and resilient economic future. Public banking is an affordable, accountable, equitable solution, and we must pass this bill. Thank you all again for joining us today to discuss the importance of public banking 
And thank you, Sam, for your leadership and for moderating this discussion today. And I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Representative Presley. I'm gonna pass it over to State Representative Nico Lagardo. Thank you, Sam, and thank you, uh, Coalition, for your leadership. And of course, special thanks to my hero and dear friend, Congresswoman Presley. Can always count on you to lay it out uh, and make it plain for the people. Uh, you know, public banking is, is personal for me and professional. So uh, when I first uh, ran for office, the first person to tell me to run was a longtime friend and, and, and mentor, Mel King, 30 years ago. And the first person to stand at my side and endorse me three years ago was that same Mel King. And then the next thing out of his mouth was, you're gonna file a public bank bill, right? <laughs> and so I had to read up, like, what is this? I had heard of North Dakota, but I didn't know about the mechanics. And we have a great team here uh, from academics to folks on the street experience with uh, small business, et cetera, who have been educating me and uh, my co-filers and making sure that we understand what's at stake. However, uh, it's not just about what's at stake for our small businesses, for our BIPOC and women-owned businesses, for our towns and cities across the Commonwealth. It's also what's at stake for the banking industry. And sometimes we need to partner with the banking industry to help them understand what's at stake for them. How do I know that? Because I've had the honor in my previous lives to run two different statewide programs and both worked with the Mass Bankers Association and other financial institutions. And both times those institutions were initially resistant to remove that incorporated economic justice into their mechanism and their operation, uh, but then became great big fans and big, huge supporters. The first was a foreclosure prevention project. Now, if we were in church or something, I would do a call and response and say, how many of you know you could get foreclosure prevention from your bank? And most people would say, yeah, I've heard of that. Not in 1996. In 1996, it was widely believed that people that did not pay their mortgage, uh, words were used like deadbeat. And on the other end, housing counselors would use words, honestly, I'll just be straight, like fascists to describe bankers. That was the climate we were dealing with in the 90s when we tried to convince bankers that nobody wants to stay in a house more than the person who's living in it. They'll pay you more money than anybody else. This is a financial venture for you where you can get a return on investment and so can that family. And then convincing housing counselors, bankers are people who have compassion and, and care about justice. And if we all come to the table together, we can get it done. And we did. And we had the first in the nation program. Uh, spoke, got to speak to Congress about it when I was like 24 or something like that, uh, but not in person. Uh, but got to do that testimony. And then here we come 20, 25 years later when I'm running the uh, Mass Save, where the, the uh, former uh, treasurer, Steve Grossman, and others said, you know, why don't you come and try to get the bankers to help us with asset development, with match savings programs, with financial education. And the, again, the nonprofits said the bankers on our steering committee are not going to accept an economic justice agenda. And you know what, at the end of the day, they did because we made the numbers plain and we made it clear how working together for justice was actually good for everyone and also good for the bottom line. And I had one banker, a VP at Mass Bankers Association say, and this isn't about me, this is about what we're about to do here. But he said, Nika, you could talk a starving dog off of a food truck. And I said, it's not my persuasive abilities. It's that what we're putting before you has been well vetted by communities cross sector. And we're putting it before you because we don't just believe it's good for our communities on the street. We believe that it's strongly good. It's, it's a, gonna be very powerful tool and asset for the banks as well. Public banking is similar. And so others in, the, you know, in this press conference are going to let uh, you know some of the details and the mechanisms about how what we're proposing here dovetails what traditional banks do, and particularly community-oriented banks that take their CRA obligations very, very, their Community Reinvestment Act obligations very seriously. I'm thinking of banks I worked with with that statewide program. Monsoon out in Western Mass. I'm thinking of, of Cape Cod Five. Uh, down on the Cape. And of course, our own Boston Private Bank and Trust, Cambridge Savings Bank. We have community banks that need help. They need more support. Their financial instruments and tools are not sufficient to meet the need pre-pandemic, let alone post-pandemic. This public bank 
We'll make sure that the resources are available, not only to the community, but also to financial institutions for partnership and to make sure that they can provide the services to the community members that they are trying to integrate into the, uh, into the broader economy and financial system of Massachusetts. So we really ask you to help us get the word out, uh, not just in the community and on the street, not just to legislators, but also in, uh, to, to people in the finance world. Uh, we wanna do this together and we think it's a win-win. Thank you so much, Representative Elgardo, and passing it off to State Representative Mike Connolly. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Sam. Uh, it's an honor to be here with Congresswoman Presley and Representative Elgardo uh, and to be advocating for this bill uh, with Senator Eldridge and with Massachusetts Public Banking. Uh, to reiterate um, what you've already heard, you know, this public bank would make low cost loans to municipalities, to local businesses, and to farmers. And this assistance would lower the debt cost for our local governments, and it would encourage entrepreneurship by providing loans with flexible and attractive terms, particularly in communities of color and in gateway cities. It's really notable to highlight this bank would not compete with the existing commercial banking sector. Rather, what our bank seeks to do is leverage state resources to provide opportunities to individuals and to organizations that can't access financing. And that's so important. And as a matter of fact, in so doing, we can make more projects and more small businesses bankable to the commercial banking sector that otherwise wouldn't be. And I wanna highlight, you know, it's because of the leadership of Congresswoman Presley and Democrats in Congress that we here in the Commonwealth are in the best fiscal position, perhaps in our history. We have about $7 billion in reserve between excess ARPA funds and our surplus. And many people say, you know, this is a once in a lifetime moment <clears throat> with the ARPA funds. What's so incredible about the opportunity with the bank is that we can, in this moment, make a one-time sustainable investment. And once we set up this public bank, it will sustain itself and it can continue to create opportunities. And so, you know, we are really striving for, you know, equity and we're striving for structural change. We have an opportunity to actually deliver equity and achieve structural change by moving forward with the public bank. So. I'm going to leave it at that. I'm so grateful for the experts and the advocates who have joined us today because this legislation has um, really bloomed over the past year into a comprehensive proposal that I hope we can move forward with soon. So thank you, Sam, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Representative Nia Evans from the Boston Ujima Project. Good morning, I'm Nia Evans, I'm the Executive Director of Boston Ujima Project. Ujima is Swahili for Cooperative Work and Responsibility. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Congresswoman Presley. Thank you, Representative Eligardo. And thank you, Representative Connolly. And thank you to uh, my good friends at the Massachusetts Public Banking uh, Coalition for stewarding and, and supporting this work. Um, as I said, Ujima is, is Swahili for Cooperative Work and Responsibility. We are a Black-led, uh, democratically run arts, finance, and business ecosystem. And I'd, I'd like to focus uh, my remarks on why we have chosen uh, the ecosystem approach and why we have uh, chosen to focus on participatory processes and why our organization is democratically run and why we believe uh, that a public bank demonstrates all of these. Um, a public bank was our original ambition uh, having identified a public bank as uh, an initiative, as a model that is appropriately focused on communities of color, uh, that is appropriately focused on working class communities, having known about uh, the history of North Dakota uh, for, for, as a group of farmers uh, who decided uh, that they needed to take decision making about their livelihoods into their own hands. And so when they had power, uh, what they did was they created a public bank. And that's why we were originally interested in a, in a public bank. Uh, why an ecosystem approach? Because the issues that we're dealing with, the racial wealth gap, poverty, we understand them as systemic issues as I, as I, as I believe many of us do. And it is our belief that a systemic uh, issue requires a systemic address. 
And so that's why we've uh, chosen an ecosystem approach, which for us includes the Ujima Fund, which is uh, noted as the country's first democratically governed uh, investment fund. And so likewise, we see a public bank as part of an ecosystem of uh, business support, as part of an ecosystem of financial services, as Representative Connolly said, not competition. Uh, and so in thinking about the importance of an ecosystem approach, we think that a, a public bank is an important part of strengthening the current ecosystem uh, that we have and providing a fuller ecosystem for working class communities and for communities of color. Uh, why participatory process? Uh, because we believe that communities are able to make decisions uh, uh, that impact them. We believe that communities have the, the expertise to understand uh, what their problems are and what the appropriate solutions are. And so with our democratic focus, I'd like to draw your attention to section seven of the legislation that talks about a board of advisories uh, for this public bank and creates a role for fellow community members, fellow business owners, fellow workers, uh, fellow people of people of color. And uh, just for the sake of time, I will uh, stop my remarks here. Thank you all. Thank you, Nicole Obi from the Black Economic Council of Massachusetts. Hi everyone, this is Nicole Obi, President and CEO of BECMA. Um, BECMA was founded in 2015 to advance the economic well-being of Black residents and businesses across the Commonwealth. We see this public banking legislation as an important opportunity towards closing the Massachusetts wealth gap, um, uh, especially for Black and other underrepresented entrepreneurs in gateway cities, as they are too often overlooked by the current banking system. Um, BECMA has championed this legislation most recently with Senate President Spilka, with Speaker Mariano, and we will continue to champion this and other measures to close the racial wealth gap in Massachusetts with our policy team led by Darian Johnson coming to us from Senator Warren's office, as well as Kareem Kaboja coming from Rep Neal's office and Courtney Brunson. Um, I feel empowered by the community and our collaboration with our partners and look forward to continuing to work to uh, advocate for this very important legislation. Thank you. Elizabeth Henry from the Environmental League of Massachusetts. Thank you. And thank you, Congresswoman Presley, Senator Eldridge, um, and the representatives Eliguardo and Connolly, and to the many advocates and civic leaders that have been championing this issue. During the Environmental League's long history advocating for the expansion of renewable energy, clean technologies, and environmental protection, we have seen persistent disparities in access to opportunities in these sectors for low-income people and people of color. The climate, environment, and clean energy sector is poised to boom in the coming decades as we decarbonize the economy, protect our natural resources, and adapt to what will be, unfortunately, many, many impacts of climate change. Some of the businesses driving these transformations will be large utilities or multinational companies with ready access to financing, but many have the potential to be small energy efficiency companies, heat pump technicians, EV charging station installers, solar contractors, and more. These sectors have this unique potential to be accessible for new entrants from a range of class, race, and educational backgrounds. And with access to capital through a public bank, existing companies and new entrepreneurs will be better equipped to grow businesses, build wealth, support families, and speed the transition we so desperately need to a clean, green economy. Thank you. Gerardo Espinoza from the Local Enterprise Assistance Fund. Thank you for your time. Uh, the, we are a community development financial institution and we are at the forefront of dealing with small businesses and also with cooperatives. And there we see that need, uh, Congresswoman, of what you mentioned in terms of flexible, in, in terms of flexible capital. And I would like to make a reference to one of our clients. I think that can illustrate this. Uh, when that client approached us for a, very, a project very dear to him in, in terms of collateral, his answer was uh, his bicycle. As you can imagine, uh, that wouldn't have gone very far in the banking system. And uh, now that client, uh, 
has the business open. It uh, financing was close to two million dollars, and in addition, it's a worker-owned cooperative that would have made it even more difficult to access the bank. Organizations like Leaf, and uh, I see that in the meeting we have Cooperative Fund of New England uh, address this uh, type of businesses that are not regular businesses, are small businesses with low capital, low collateral. And we also work, for instance, with land trusts, which are not part of the client base of existing businesses. And the second remark I wanted to add was uh, the, there is the president of a large national CDFI that specializes in micro businesses and her favorite expression that I think uh, many of us in the field like as well is her favorite expression is we love to lose clients. And what she means by that is that uh, basically when the clients grows and needs uh, larger and more traditional financial services, they go back to the banking sector, right? So losing clients for the CDFI industry, I think it's a sign of success. In that sense, we are complementary to the, to the, the banking sector. So the need is there and the complementarity is there as well. Thank you. Great, Jen Fagel from the Commonwealth Kitchen. Uh, thanks, Sam. Uh, glad to be here this morning. Jen Fagel, Commonwealth Kitchen. We are Boston's Food Business Development Center, and we are on a mission to build a food economy that is truly grounded in racial, social, and economic justice. You can imagine our work in the last two years at the, at the center of food and racial equity has been uh, uh, just completely turned upside down. Uh, we work with more than 250 small businesses in Eastern Massachusetts, all in the food industry across sectors of food trucks, caterers, bakers, product companies, and restaurants. And we can tell you for, for a fact that the restaurant industry is in a free fall. And we are so appreciative to Congress, uh, Congresswoman Presley for what she's tr trying to do at the the national level to bring more resources into the restaurant industry. There is an enormous need to think about this at the state and local level. Um, we are seeing businesses that are on the, on the precipice of closing. If these restaurants close, what does that mean to every other small business in the main streets across the, the Commonwealth? This is an industry that has historically been a challenge, particularly for business owners of color. Um, access to capital is an enormous difficulty for them and being undercapitalized at the beginning in an industry that is enormously difficult with very small margins is, is a challenge to start with. In the moment we're in now, if we wanna think about recovery, we wanna think about happen, having that happen quickly, we have to find a way to put resources out to support these small businesses in these neighborhoods across the state. Um, the public bank is gonna be a key part of that strategy. The connections and relationships of people you see on this call, the, the, the work that's happening across what we do with groups like BECMA and UJIMA and Amplify Latinx and others is the key to making sure that we can have a truly equitable uh, economic recovery. And so Commonwealth Kitchen is here to say we are enormously um, supportive to see this public bank uh, go forward. And, and thank you for all the work everybody's doing to try to support our industry. Thanks, Sam. Mark Drayson from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Thank you, Sam, and uh, good morning to everyone. A special thanks, of course, to the Congresswoman, the representatives, Senator Eldridge, who I know is not with us here today, but is a great leader on this issue. Uh, it's so great to have all of your support. I want to uh, uh, add to Grace's comment in the chat and just throw out a special shout out to BECMA for putting this issue as a prime uh, legislative objective. Uh, this bill has been kicking around for a while. It needed a few champions. Uh, BECMA helped to make sure that happened. And so many of those champions are gathering on this call today. That's what's going to move this bill out of committee. It's what is hopefully going to get it capitalized with ARPA or surplus funds, and it's gonna get it operating. Uh, we have the great example in North Dakota. We have plenty of other examples in Europe and elsewhere. And even here in Massachusetts, we have public banks, we have mass housing, we have, the, the, we have mass development. We used to have the Community Developed Finance Corporation, Community Development Finance Corporation, CDFC. We've experimented with this in Massachusetts successfully already, but what we don't have is a public bank that actually 
lends on the street to small businesses, helps municipalities with a portion of financing. Municipalities, many of my member municipalities, can get money for a difficult project for a portion from the private banking sector, but need additional funds from something like a public bank. We don't have that kind of a comprehensive approach to helping small businesses and municipalities with financing that they need and that they can repay here in Massachusetts. And the public bank would accomplish that for us. So it's really critical that we get it funded, we get it up and running, and uh, everybody stops talking about North Dakota as the only example in the United States and starts talking about North Dakota and Massachusetts. Thank you all very much. Keith Mahoney from the Boston Foundation. Good morning, um, and thank you, Sam. And it's it's nice to be in such great company. Um, I'm pleased to be here on behalf of Greater Boston's Community Foundation to support the creation of a public bank in Massachusetts. This past spring, the Boston Indicators, the research team housed at the foundation, released a report in conjunction with the Coalition for an Equitable Economy to trace how systemic and interpersonal racism has held back Greater Boston's entrepreneurs of color. This report, The Color of the Capital Gap, traced the historic lack of capital access for Black, Latino, and AAPI business owners, a result of a wide range of factors that have limited wealth accumulation and excluded entrepreneurs of color from many programs. Our report showed that there is nearly a half billion dollar shortfall of capital needed by entrepreneurs of color in Massachusetts. And it is that shortfall, not a lack of good ideas, attempts, or dedication that is preventing equitable economic growth. This is not a problem for previous generations or for history books. This is a problem our entrepreneurs face every single day. Establishing a public bank in Massachusetts will start to remove these barriers and be a step towards closing the wealth gap. This will address past and present inequities that our report shows and that are far too present for too many people in our Commonwealth. These inequities are not just experienced by women, people of color as individuals, but they're experienced by whole communities, neighborhoods, businesses, and organizations working hard to achieve economic justice that we deserve. Thank you. And last but never least, uh, Betty Francisco from the Boston Impact Initiative Fund. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you this morning and to the coalition for championing this important legislation. I'm Betty Francisco, the CEO of Boston Impact Initiative. We're a place-based social impact fund that invests integrated capital, equity debt and grants into regenerative local enterprises in eastern Massachusetts that are owned and controlled by entrepreneurs of color. Our larger mission is to use integrated capital to close the racial wealth divide. A public bank that's focused on using public dollars to support local small businesses can accelerate innovation, small business creation, and wealth building jobs in the Commonwealth. On average, it takes $30,000 to bootstrap a business dream into reality. But many entrepreneurs of color may be starting with no personal savings, no credit history, no friends and family capital. Our entrepreneurs, many of who are women of color and immigrant entrepreneurs, have been failed by traditional commercial banks. And while we partner with so many of our organizations right here, um, uh, like Ujima, Beckma, Commonwealth Kitchen, and others, we need more inclusive lending capacity in our ecosystem. A public bank that's not beholden to shareholders or maximizing financial returns, but to serving the public good, will bring greater access to banking, to safe financial products, and capital to those who have not been served by a traditional system. Now more than ever, we need to leverage public financing to drive economic justice in our local communities. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you, Betty. Um, so uh, we now are gonna turn into our Q&A session. Um, joining us also for that, uh, if uh, there are any uh, uh, highly technical questions, we have with us uh, today, Christine Bassan, the uh, Leo Gottlieb Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. Um, who has been one of the intellectual backbones and partners for this work. And then we also have Ruth Kaplan and Nancy Ryan, who both serve as co-chairs of Massachusetts Public Banking. So uh, Shira, uh, your first question. Um, uh, go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and um, uh, your affiliation. Hi, thank you. I'm Shira Schoenberg. I'm a reporter with Commonwealth Magazine. And I had a broader question and then a kind of more technical one. The broader one is just, how do you make sure that a public bank is financially sustainable? 
if the goal is to provide low cost loans to populations that have been deemed riskier by the traditional banking industry. Um, and then the second question is, could a public bank potentially serve the cannabis industry, which has also said they have a real need for traditional financing? Chris, do you want to take that and uh, maybe uh, Gerardo as well? Sure, I can. Uh, I'll take that first question about um, how do you create sustainable and ensure sustainable and sound funding. Um, the bank actually would have uh, all the advantages of banking. I just take one minute to step back and say banks are really powerful lenders because they have special privileges in our society to create money out of credit. And, uh, and extending that privilege to the state just makes an enormous amount of sense. There's no reason the state, which actually empowers other banks, shouldn't have the same power. The state could actually lend at even lower costs than commercial banks because of a number of operating advantages. It ha would have one main depositor, the state. It wouldn't have shareholders. Those are the two most obvious, right? Uh, it wouldn't have all the transactional um, work that commercial banks have. Um, and the bank would also be regulated just as carefully as every other bank. So the legislation puts, you know, puts the bank within the public bank within the standard regulatory regime. So the bank will be just as safe, able to reach farther than commercial banks. And finally, I would say it will do that in partnership with commercial banks, community banks, and CDFIs who are very expert uh, and have a long track word, uh, record of sound lending. What, uh, what I can add to that is that uh, if when you look at the typical, uh, typical commercial bank, uh, the part of the expen uh, expenses and a significant portion of expenses is all the aspect of the retail network to reach clients and also all the marketing that is involved in that and the long officers that are involved in that. I think the, in the case of the public bank, there are two elements that create significant efficiencies and they also can help with the credit risk. The idea of the client, client bank is the, or the public bank is that the depositors would be funding from the state treasurer. And so it's, in that sense, it's not competing for deposit with the commercial banks. And in terms of deployment, again, the concept is that uh, to a large extent, uh, the deployment would be through ex that existing network of lenders that are already on the forefront of the community, uh, including those community banks, the CDFIs. So this aspect that uh, this aspect of uh, all those savings uh, allow to the public bank to provide the uh, lower cost financing to these intermediaries that uh, are existing now to serve that community. And the other element as well is uh, the, these intermediaries are, uh, present a very good credit risk profile. And uh, we saw that, for instance, in, during the 2008 crisis, the, while the banking uh, industries uh, obviously suffered a lot during the period due to the quality of the loans, uh, the CDFIs did, in terms of the quality of the portfolio, did nationwide, did particularly well during that period. And there are a number of reasons that explain that, and I will not go into that, but all that just goes to illustrate the two aspects, the, the higher quality of portfolio that the public bank can have and the extraordinary savings that they would have in terms of their operational efficiency. Thank you. And the question on the cannabis uh, industry? Sam, I, I can take that one. Uh, sorry, I didn't get to that. The, the, the bill sets out uh, categories of eligible recipients uh, for the bank's lending. And, and those uh, um, categories include, pick out all the kinds of borrowers who have been shut out of conventional bank lending right now. So that includes borrowers from underserved communities, municipalities are having trouble getting um, getting funds, uh, borrowers with unconventional uh, capital uh, um, allocations like land trusts that Gerardo mentioned. So if you have a cannabis business that falls into one of those categories, no reason it couldn't be funded. On the other hand, if it doesn't, if it can get, if that industry, you know, and that those entrepreneurs can get funding elsewhere and don't fit within the bill's 
remit, then they wouldn't be eligible. A very specific targeted bill that wants to reach borrowers who have been shut out from conventional bank loans. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Sam from GBH has two questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, first, North Dakota's bank has been around for over a century, and I know some other states are considering doing something like this, California, New York, I think New Mexico. Um, what, for anybody who can answer this, why do you think it's taken so long for this to gain traction, even though North Dakota's bank has been around for so long? Uh, my second question is, to what extent do you think this could help with some of the housing issues that we're seeing statewide? Um, could this help with mortgage funding, et cetera? In terms of uh, why it's taken so long, I think the 2008 uh, financial crisis really got people looking at the whole financial system. And that was really an impetus for a number of states to begin looking at public banking. Um, Washington DC was one, um, not a state, but uh, had a, a vigorous campaign, many, many states across the country. And of course we've seen in California um, legislation setting up the process for uh, municipalities and counties to create public banks. San Francisco is very far ahead um, in this process right now. Uh, the New Jersey governor has set up a process. Philadelphia is moving ahead. So again, um, that 2008 financial crisis was just sort of a wake up call that we have to do something differently. And um, that was part of what got us going here in Massachusetts uh, with our campaign. And we're certainly hoping this is the year to move it um, to the finish line. If I could add just one thing to that, um, I think that answer is absolutely right. Uh, it's also the case that there was lots of experimentation in the 19th century in the US with public banking. So there were public banks. Massachusetts partly had, had a partly owned public bank. Kentucky had a public bank. And, and as you know, the, when the Fed was established and we became um, sort of consolidated our money delivery system into banking, there was less scrutiny about, uh, about how that delivery system was working. So I think both the financial crisis and the the unremitting um, evidence about the fact that we haven't managed to reach underserved borrowers, uh, the racial wealth gap, those things have made it necessary to revisit old strategies. If there is something, Christine, that I can highlight, because I'd like to speak to just some of the coalition partners, including BECMA, and one similarly situated is precisely what Christine just mentioned about the focus on these unbanked and underserved communities. It was the 2008 crisis, but it was also the COVID pandemic that really illustrated to states like Massachusetts that there is actual money and resources and opportunities within communities like these. It was the Boston Globe article about the Massachusetts Taxpayer Foundation that illustrated that the state's economy could grow by 25 billion over five years if we were able to close the racial gap. And we have a variety of different ways that we can do that but the public bank does a particularly great job at making sure that we have capital and other financial resources in these communities. So I think for many, many, many years, states took for granted that things worked for them. Banks were able to give to certain communities, but the communities it wasn't able to give to weren't served and weren't adequately engaging in their economies. Now states realize that full engagement by black and brown communities has financial benefits beyond the obvious benefit it has for closing the racial wealth gap. Um, Senator Eldridge has joined us. Sam, yes. do you mind holding on your second question for a second? Sure, no problem. Thank you. Senator, good morning. Good morning. Thanks, Samuel. Um, good morning, everyone. So sorry to be late and, and um, I'm, I'm not going to Add, add too much. I, I'm just so grateful to, to, to Beckman's whole team for really lifting up uh, this bill, the, the public banking bill. This is something that I've worked with uh, Representative Connolly uh, for a number of years and Representative Eligardo and the public banking coalition has just been absolutely amazing. And we you know, finally really this session, you know, come together with this comprehensive bill. 
And I want to thank Congresswoman uh, Presley and, and Treasurer Goldberg for their, their support. And I think what, what I would just say is that, you know, the district I represent, 14 communities, uh, some rural, some suburban, one city. And, you know, whether it's about climate resilient projects, uh, whether it's about uh, cannabis entrepreneurs, including uh, people of color and, and veterans, uh, whether it's entrepreneurs uh, that want to start a small business or have some idea, but they can't get financial support from the traditional bank, that there's such a gap here. And I know that everyone has already talked about that gap, but you know, we're, we're not competing with the traditional banks. And uh, I think it would really uh, leverage a lot, a lot of money with this first $50 million infusion uh, to really get a lot of projects going on crises that we're seeing in the state, the climate crisis, uh, a uh, housing crisis, uh, as well as just the structural racism uh, that we continue to see in, in our communities about who, you know, who gets support, who doesn't, who gets a job, who doesn't. So, so you know, everything from communities of color uh, to immigrants uh, to, you know, many of my work, uh, working class communities, uh, this bill would really provide a boost of support uh, for a lot of important projects that would help the Commonwealth as a whole. So, so sorry to come in on the later side, but um, thanks so much to BECMA for organizing this press conference and, and the Public Banking Coalition. And I'm really hopeful we can uh, pass this bill this session. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Eldridge. Sam, we'll go back to you. Yeah, my second question was just about housing and the housing shortages that we're seeing really statewide and how something like this could help uh, fund mortgages and things like that. There, go ahead. I think Ruth might be might be frozen. Uh, again, if you if you um, look carefully at the bill, there there are certain provisions within which the bank can help um, those working on housing. We wrote them quite carefully so so as not to interfere with the really uh, ecology of housing funding that's available in Massachusetts. So we can get back to you on more with more specifics about exactly how that works. But the idea was to allow the bank to fill in the gaps where we might need more help in uh, extending affordable financing uh, without interfering and disrupting with what's a very complicated industry of finance in the housing area. The other thing I'd just like to add is the importance of participatory lending. That's extremely important in North Dakota. It's meant that the local banks have actually thrived in North Dakota. And that is a key part of what the public bank would do, which would be to do loans with local banks where the local bank would originate the loan, they'd get the origination fee and the public bank would come in and help them do larger loans than they could do on their own. So this is a cooperative effort with um, the public banks in Massachusetts. Um, so I think that's important for us to keep in mind. Something that I may add on this regard is that um, some of the, again, the idea is that uh, the public bank will be instrumental in supporting CDFIs and some of the, some of the CDFIs that are already doing very important work in Massachusetts are CDFIs like the Massachusetts Housing Investment Corporation. You have uh, Blue, Blue Half Capital. Um, and many of the CDCs have also CDFIs uh, associated with them. A good example is uh, uh, Dorchester Bay, that is a CDC and has a CDFI. So the, through existing, the existing CDFI network is already helping in, in that uh, affordable housing sector, and this will provide them more flexible and low-cost resources. Yeah. 